Thank you very much. The next item of business is a debate on motion 24224 in the name of Kate Forbes on the Budget Scotland number no. 5 bill at stage 1. Can I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Kate Forbes to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to start by thanking the Finance and Constitution Committee for their report, to which I will respond ahead of Stage 3. Today, though, we are reminded of the difference that one year can make. At this point in last year's Budget Bill, we had yet to pivot to respond to the emerging threat of the virus that was to come in the following days. And since then, I believe it has been clear that only by working together as a parliament can we provide the support that our people, our businesses and our communities need and deserve. And that's what I have worked hard to do with this budget. I'm committed to building the consensus across the chamber that we need to deliver this budget for Scotland. Why? Well, simply because this budget is key to supporting our economy, our public services, to funding the vaccination programme and laying the foundations for recovery. But to do all of that, it needs to pass. And that is why I appeal to parties across the parliament to work together to secure passage of the budget. The constantly evolving impact of COVID combined with the financial uncertainty presented by the delayed UK budget has meant that this has been a challenging budget to produce and I recognise too that it has been difficult for Parliament to scrutinise. I have been as open and as transparent as possible in updating Parliament on our funding position. That includes the additional £1.1 billion of additional spending proposals that I announced last week for next year's budget. The delayed UK budget in March is key to confirming what the actual funding position will be for Scotland next year. I think it's likely that will mean we need to make further changes to the bill following the UK budget to ensure that the allocations reflect the resources available and to secure parliamentary support. Over the past few weeks, I've met with every party in this chamber several times, and I'd like to thank all members for their consideration of the budget and their willingness to engage in discussions. The additional £1.1 billion of spending proposals I outlined last week reflected the cross-parliament priorities identified in those discussions. It included the request by the Liberal Democrats for an increase in spending for mental health and education. It responded to the suggestion by the Greens to focus on energy efficiency measures and further steps to tackle poverty and inequalities. It reflected the cross-party ask to extend non-domestic rates relief to increase the funds for affordable housing and to enhance local government's budget. Presiding officer, I did that because my overarching objective is to support the people of Scotland through these most challenging of months. And that brings me to the two reasoned amendments to the Budget Bill today. And I should state at the outset that the government doesn't vote for reasoned amendments to the Budget Bill until negotiations with other parties have been completed. So I'd ask Labour and the Tories to consider continuing to negotiate in good faith before Stage 2 and after the UK Government's budget in order to make progress on their proposals. Firstly, to Jackie Bailey's amendment, I thank her for the various discussions that we have had over the last few weeks, and I remain fully committed to exploring her proposals in advance of stage two and after the UK government's budget, which will provide greater clarity on the funding available to us. I'm sympathetic to considering what further steps we can take to support carers, and so we'll carefully examining, examine this proposal in detail over the next fortnight. Two main issues still need to be considered to ensure this proposal is deliverable, and that's why I regret that I cannot support the amendment as it stands today. One of those issues uh, is that this government has already committed to collective bargaining, which I know is a principle that the Labour Party also holds to, and I wouldn't want anything to cut across that. And secondly, it needs to be affordable. And as the government, I ultimately need to ensure that proposals on pay which are recurring and so cannot be covered by one-off COVID consequentials, can be funded, particularly when there will be knock-on impacts on other workforces. All that being said, my public commitment today is to explore carers' pay with officials and with Jackie Bailey on behalf of the Labour Party over the coming weeks to see if we can come to a compromise. 
And to Murdo Fraser's amendment, I have repeatedly thanked local government for their efforts over the last year, and that is why I provided a further £275 million to local government in last week's statement. Anything further would be subject to the UK government's budget, as all funding has been committed, including preemptively assuming an additional £500 million of COVID consequentials and pledging to support uh, businesses. I know that the Liberal Democrats and the Greens have further asks also, and I hope that all parties here today will consider enabling Stage 1 to pass so that these proposals can be considered in good faith. Presiding officer, whilst engagement across party lines continue, this budget is already delivering the certainty that businesses need. A key ask from businesses and from members of this chamber was to extend this year's rates relief for retail, hospitality and leisure for the whole of next year. And I was pleased to propose this extended relief in my statement last week, providing that certainty to businesses in these critically impacted sectors. And on top of this, we are now providing for the lowest poundage available anywhere in the UK, saving ratepayers over £120 million compared with previously published plans. Presiding officer, this pandemic is first and foremost a health crisis. We have a commitment to ensure that all health consequentials are passed on in full. We have not only delivered that for next year, we have exceeded it. As I announced last week, we are proposing to provide £120 million of additional funding to help tackle the pandemic's significant mental health impacts, exceeding the ask by the Liberal Democrats for an additional £100 million for mental health. And at the same time, we are providing further support for the recovery of the NHS when there are an additional £60 million to continue this vital work. And overall, this budget provides a record level of spending on our health frontline. Members across the Chamber have asked that we provide a fair settlement for local government. The next year's uh, local government settlement will be £11.6 billion. In addition, they will receive £259 million of non-recurring additional COVID funding. This settlement not only gives local authorities the resources and the flexibility to respond to the new challenges that the pandemic has created, but it also provides continued fiscal certainty that does not exist in England through our policy of guaranteeing non-domestic rates revenues. I will. Murder Fraser. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for, for giving way. In relation to local government, would you accept the case put forward by COSLA that the core funding from uh, the, the Scottish Government has increased by just 0.9 per cent from last year to this year coming? Cabinet Secretary. The point that Murder Fraser does pick up on is the difference between COVID consequential funding and our own core settlement funding. So out of our own core settlement funding, which is designed to cover recurring costs that local government are key to delivering, like education um, and other things, our non-COVID recurring uh, settlement hasn't actually increased um, that much. And we have tried to protect local government settlement. Over and above that, there is, of course, additional COVID consequentials for the Scottish Government, which we have passed on to local government. That includes the £259 million that I mentioned for next year, which was topped up by £275 million to help with COVID pressures. So there is a distinction to be made there between uh, recurring uh, funding and non-recurring funding. We are also the only devolved government to have committed to extend the COVID-19 reliefs into 2021-22, replacing £719 million of non-domestic rates income. Presiding officer, I recognise the contribution of our public sector workers and the ambition on all sides of the chamber, including my own, to go further on public sector pay. The UK government pay freeze has a direct and material impact on our funding position, so a balance needs to be struck between fairly rewarding public sector workers, job security and maintaining employment levels across all sectors in the wider Scottish economy. Our progressive approach nevertheless maximises awards for the lowest paid, recognising that the impacts of the pandemic have not been felt equally across society, whilst ensuring that pay rises are affordable now and in the future. And so as I come to a close, presiding officer, all of this clearly shows that this budget will deliver the key priorities of creating jobs, supporting our sustainable recovery, whilst responding to the health crisis and tackling inequality. I have responded to the asks across the Chamber, and I hope that we can all come together to pass the budget and deliver this important funding for the people of Scotland. 
Thank you very much. I now call on Murdo Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 2424.1. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, the Finance Secretary is indeed a very fortunate person because the budget she is setting out today is the largest in the history of devolution, the highest budget ever that the Scottish Administration has had to deal with and more money than any predecessor in office. And that is all thanks to the broad shoulders and deep pockets of the British Government supporting individuals, businesses and public services in Scotland at this difficult time. And this is a budget where the revenue has increased according to Spice. Of course I'll give way. Ivan McKee. When, Mur when Murdo Fraser talks about the broad shoulders, can you tell us how much of that money the UK Government has had to borrow? Well, Murdo Fraser. Well, Presiding Officer, you know, let's just be thankful. Let's just be thankful we are part of Great Britain, part of the fifth largest economy in the world, with the strength and security of a financial system that allows us to borrow money easily and cheaply on the international market. And how foolish it would be to give up that opportunity of borrowing that money as part of that secure financial system that the SNP benches would have us do, presiding officer. Now, presiding officer, if the benches will all just calm down for a second, I can carry on. Uh, with the rest of my speech. Um, this is a budget where the revenue has increased, according to SPICE, some 11% from last year to next. And, and these figures take no account of the additional COVID support we have seen in the current financial year, now some $9.7 billion in Barnet Consequentials, guaranteed funding the NHS, individuals and supporting businesses throughout Scotland. Now, back in January, we set out, I'd set out a number of our budget asks to the Finance Secretary, and I am pleased that many of these have been delivered, again, thanks to all the additional funds coming from the British Government. We ask that there be no further increases in income tax, and that has been delivered because there is more money coming from the British Government. We ask that there be more money to employ teachers, much needed in our schools at this time, and that is being delivered thanks to more money from the British Government. We ask for all Barnet consequentials arising from the extra NHS spending down south to be passed on to the health service, more money being delivered thanks to the British Government. And we ask for 100% rates relief for businesses in the retail, hospitality and leisure sector, which has been hard hit by COVID restrictions, as we know, to be extended for a further 12 months, and that has been delivered thanks to the British Government. Now, of course, Kate Forbes. I would agree with the member that all of these are wonderful things. Of course, the Scottish public won't enjoy any of this unless the budget passes. So will the Tories ensure that it is passed? Presiding officer, the Scottish government, the Scottish people won't enjoy any of this if we break our link with the British government yeah. that's providing all this money to back up the public services of Scotland. <laughs> now, presiding officer, we have asked that the existing business support schemes be continued, and the finance secretary has indicated her willingness uh, to do this. And, and while the existing schemes are welcome. I have raised with her before, and indeed many other members from other, uh, these benches and others have raised the same issue, the need to make sure that these schemes are as comprehensive as possible. Because I still get too many constituents coming to me saying that they are not eligible for existing support schemes. Often these are businesses which are not legally obliged to close, which are still permitted to trade, but have seen a huge percentage of their trade disappear. And we see that in aspects of retail, we see it in uh, bed and breakfast, we see it in parts of the tourism and events sector. I had it just yesterday from people operating in the wedding sector. And while the sector specific funds that have been set up are very welcome, there are many businesses that do not meet the criteria for these. The discretionary funds available to local councils are also welcome, but in many cases the funds available simply do not go far enough to meet the need. And I know that in some councils, for example, the total that can be paid out to an individual business is £2,000, which in many cases goes, goes nowhere near meeting the unmet need if we are to help businesses survive over the remaining months of lockdown restrictions. Now, presiding officer, the British government is stepping up, extending the furlough scheme, providing direct support for businesses in Scotland. I hope the Scottish government will do the same with the funds at their disposal. Now, while there is much in this budget we welcome, there are remaining issues yet to be addressed. Our reasoned amendment today sets out two areas of concern for us, and the first relates to the local government settlement. Yesterday, this parliament discussed and voted on the issue of a fiscal framework for local councils, whereby it would provide a fair funding settlement. We propose that councils should see their funding budgets increase by at least in line with the total increases in the Scottish budget. Now, earlier I referenced the fact that the revenue budget available to the Finance Secretary had gone up, according to SPICE, by some 11%, and I accept that some of that is non-recurring funding. 
And yet, according to COSLA, the core revenue funding for councils is up not by 11 per cent, or even by half of that, or, but by less than a tenth, simply 0.9 per cent. And that 0.9 per cent will not cover, uh, or only, only just cover, one half of the likely increase in staff costs if councils follow the Scottish Government's pay policy. According to COSLA, the revenue shortfall, just to stand still in the coming year, amounts to some £362 million. That money would not allow councils to do anything extra over and above what they are currently doing. It is simply what they need to meet existing commitments. And the budget before us therefore falls short of what is required. So this government needs to stop treating local councils as the whipping boy of the budget process. It needs to start treating councils fairly and it should start with this budget. The other area I would highlight is in relation to the provision of free breakfasts and lunches for all primary school pupils. This was something the Parliament voted for last year, and it needs to be delivered as soon as possible. We know there are clear benefits in terms of health, in terms of educational outcomes, from providing these meals to young children. If this government is serious about helping to tackle poverty and helping tackle the attainment gap, this is something they could do now rather than kick it into the long grass. Presiding officer, while there is much in this budget we welcome, it is only there because of the deep pockets and the broad shoulders of the British Government. As it stands, this is not a budget we can support because it falls short of what the Scottish people and Scottish society requires. And I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 224.2. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, when the Parliament passed our budget on the 5th of March 2020, we could not have foreseen the year that lay ahead. Eight days later, the first patient in Scotland died of coronavirus, and today that death toll stands at 7,084. Every one of them a tragedy, every one of them a mother, a father, son or daughter who is mourned by the people they leave behind. And I want to note these deaths at the start of this budget debate today because the proposals before us must be one of our first steps in recovering from this national tragedy. Nothing can ever bring back the thousands of people that coronavirus has taken from us. But the actions we take today, if we choose well, can prevent more harm. Not just from the direct effects of the virus, but from mass unemployment that could drive thousands, hundreds of thousands of people into poverty. From the suffering that could be the result of an NHS that struggles to get back on its feet and provide vital care to people suffering from life-threatening diseases like cancer or waiting in pain for too long for operations and also from the lagging effects of increased inequality that could damage the life chances of our young people for years and years to come. In this budget, presiding officer, we have the chance to choose a different direction of travel that really makes this a budget for recovery. One that invests in our economy, gives us the best chance of protecting jobs and businesses, remobilizes our NHS, and also rewards our frontline workers. There is much in this budget that we welcome, including the deep pockets of the UK government, but it doesn't go far enough. The coronavirus crisis may have exposed the deep inequalities in our society, but it actually didn't create them. And the truth is, when the pandemic hit, Scotland's economy was still struggling to fully recover from the last recession. So we can't afford for the government to make the same mistakes they made after the last economic crisis. We need a more bold, a more ambitious budget from the government that doesn't just take Scotland back to where we were before coronavirus, but builds the foundations for a better and more prosperous future. That is why we are genuinely disappointed that the Scottish National Investment Bank which the First Minister herself called one of the most significant developments in the lifetime of the Parliament just three months ago, has had a budget cut. It's why we have called for more support for councils and for the government to fill the £518 million COVID funding gap that they're experiencing. It's why we want more funding for mental health, while England and Wales are spending 11% of their health budget on mental health, Scotland is only spending 8%. And the SNP government 
have cut services in real terms by £26 million pounds between 2010 and 2019. Happy to give way. John Mason. Is, is the member arguing that, that a lot higher percentage should be given to mental health and a lower percentage and therefore a cut to other health services? Jackie Bailey. Um, actually, there is no need for a cut, as if you listen to your own Cabinet Secretary, there is a lot more money coming into health just now than there has ever been. Ever. It is the highest budget ever. So there is an opportunity to invest some of that new money into mental health. And I think that was an objective that we should all share. But, Presiding Officer, let me turn to those who are being most let down by this budget and the people who are the subject of Labour's amendment today, and that's social care workers. These workers, who looked after some of our most vulnerable people during the pandemic, were applauded by us all during the first lockdown. Every week we stood and clapped for them. Now they deserve more than our praise, they deserve a raise. The budget as it stands today has no provision for a pay increase for social care workers beyond the living wage. Social care workers are mostly women. They're low paid. Many of them have to work more than one job to make ends meet. And during the pandemic, they were putting themselves at risk and dealing with death on a daily basis. And the truth is, they were badly let down by the government. They were let down in the provision of PPE. They were let down by a lack of guidance. They were let down by the routine discharge of patients with COVID from hospitals to care homes, a decision that created a wave of deaths that many had to face each and every day they went to their work. It is unacceptable that we should be asking people to do these jobs for poverty pay. That is why we've laid a reasoned amendment backing the GMB's call for £15 an hour for social care workers. This isn't just about fair pay for a day's work. It's fundamentally about decency and dignity. We cannot and we should not expect people to do some of the most demanding jobs in our society for poverty pay. The coronavirus crisis has opened the public's eyes to the work social care workers do. It is not just the workers, their unions and those of us on these benches who are demanding action. It is the public who want to see them rewarded. Let me thank Kate Forbes, the Finance Secretary, for her very positive engagement on this issue. Labour's reasoned amendment reflects those discussions and provides for a staged approach. An immediate rise of £12 per hour, followed by a review to achieve £15 per hour. And I am happy to agree continuing discussions with the Cabinet Secretary to get to that point. So let me be very clear, Presiding Officer. While there is much that we would like to see improved in this budget, if the Government accepts our amendment and rewards social care workers and gives them the respect they deserve, then the Government can rely on Labour's support for this budget at Stage 3. Thank you very much. And I now call on Bruce Crawford on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Deputy President Officer, when I agreed to take on the role of the Convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee, now unbelievably almost five years ago, I could never have imagined just how much of a roller coaster I was letting myself in for. While the mysteries of the fiscal framework and the impact of Brexit were challenging enough, they have of course been overshadowed by the tragic national emergency which we continue to face. In what is probably my last speech as Convener, I would like to pay tribute to my colleagues on the committee throughout session five, who have largely put political differences to one side in carrying out our essential scrutiny role. We have primarily worked on a consensual basis and always in a constructive and respectful manner. Indeed, we have unanimously agreed all of our budget and pre-budget reports during this parliament, quite an achievement by any committee dealing with the budget. I would, however, wish to take this opportunity of most sincerely thanking our clerking team, led by James Johnston, who have supported, advised and, yes, sometimes cautioned me on my approach. They are remarkable, incredibly hard-working professionals who, over the course of the last five years, I have come to greatly admire. <laughs> President Officer, it is inevitable that the focus of our report on Budget 21-22 has been on the economic and fiscal impact of the pandemic. 
We recognise that the progress of the vaccination programme provides for some optimism. However, both the UK and Scottish economic and fiscal outlooks remain highly uncertain. The impact of the UK's trading relationship with the EU also remains unclear. Given that continuing uncertainty and with borrowing costs extraordinarily low, the Committee's view is that the economic recovery from the crisis should be the priority in the next financial year rather than fiscal consolidation. The Committee notes that there does not yet appear to be any evidence of overall differential impact on the Scottish economy relative to the UK economy from either the pandemic or the future trading relationship with the EU. Given the way the fiscal framework operates, this means that the Scottish budget is relatively well protected from the continuing UK-wide economic shock. However, the medium-term financial strategy highlights a considerable risk that the Scottish income tax base might prove less resilient to COVID-19 and Brexit simply due to differences in sectoral composition of the two economies once we begin to emerge from the pandemic. The MTFS also suggests this means there are differences are likely to emerge when business support measures such as the furlough scheme are withdrawn. The committee has therefore invited the Cabinet Secretary to explain what actions can, be, can have or can be taken by the Scottish Government to address this considerable risk. We have also recommended that our successor committee continues to closely monitor the impact of Scotland's relative tax performance on the budget as the economy emerges from the pandemic and government support is withdrawn. A key question for the committee was the extent to which the pandemic has had a differential impact on sections of the population and some sectors of the economy. While some sections of the population have been well protected in terms of employment and income, others have suffered economically. The, pandem the pandemic has led to more job losses, higher rates of furlough and less ability to work from home among younger, lower income and less educated people. The committee recognises, therefore, that it's highly likely that the crisis has ex exacerbated existing structural inequalities, with particular severe consequences for people on low economy incomes. The committee's view is that a fair economic recovery from COVID will require proactive measures to reduce wealth and income inequality, with a need for a particular focus on supporting lower income less educated and younger workers in the labour market. It should also help them pro progress up the labour market while driving up standards of pay and workplace rights. The committee also suggests that as we emerge from the national lockdown, the Scottish Government should consider targeting business support based on protecting jobs and businesses subject to restrictions and temporarily lower demand. But that support should also be targeted targeted at incubating emerging businesses and sectors. In conclusion, President Officer, the Committee recognises the fiscal and economic challenges arising from COVID-19 are enormous, but crisis can create new thinking. As we begin to shift focus from crisis management to recovery, it's essential that the differential impact of the pandemic, especially on low-income families, is addressed. And at the same time, this creates an opportunity to re-examine the persistent structural inequalities in our society. There can be little doubt such inequalities have been exacerbated by the current crisis. This should include an examination of how the structure of devolved taxes could be reformed to support fair and equal economic recovery. The Committee's view is that a fundamental consideration of what the tax system, Scottish tax system is designed to achieve must be undertaken. In particular, the role of tax policy in achieving a just, sustainable and strong economy as we emerge from the grip of COVID should be considered and any review should include the breadth and nature of the tax base, the impact of economic growth on the tax base and the relationship between local Scottish and UK wide taxes. We recommend a national conversation jointly led by the Government and Parliament, which should include a wide range of voices from across Scotland. 
And in doing so, President Officer, I have every confidence that Parliament can rise to the enormous challenge it will face in session six in addressing the tragic and brutal impact of COVID. And finally, if I may finish on a slightly more optimistic note, I have tremendously enjoyed my role as convener and I wish our successor committee the very best of luck in dealing with the significant challenges it and the new parliament will undoubtedly face. President Officer. Thank you very much, convener. And I now call on Willie Rennie. If uh, that is Bruce Crawford's last speech, can I just say that I think he'll be a huge loss um, to this parliament. He's made immense contribution to political life in Scotland. Um, I, I've always admired his persistent, polite and respectful approach uh, to politics, I'm sure, despite the strain that he's faced on various occasions. Um, but I wish him well in the future. Uh, we will be voting for stage one of this budget. Um, we'll be supporting it because of the gains that we secured from the Finance Secretary announced in our statement to Parliament last week, £120 million for mental health to make spending up to £1.2 billion a goal that we set to address the mental health crisis. Additional funds for education to help pupils to bounce back from their loss of schooling in this pandemic and more support for businesses who are on their knees in this lockdown. These are the priorities we set out to Kate Forbes in discussions and she followed through in her statement last week and we are grateful for that. These are sufficient to secure our support at stage one. But the Finance Secretary knows, because I've told her, um, that we are on the hunt for more from the next stages of the budget. More funds will be coming from the Chancellor, we suspect, in the budget in March. And we know that the Finance Secretary is very wise and will have been keeping some funds back um, for future negotiations. So we know that more money is going to be available. So we'll be looking for support for local government, who stepped up during the pandemic when it mattered most. But they continue to be at the rough end of the government's priorities. They have faced a cut to their capital budget just when investment is required. They have been compensated for the council tax freeze, but it's not enough and it won't be built in for future years either. We'll be looking to address the unfairness of the funding for the North East of Scotland. And we want to see support for business and people who have been left behind, especially the tourism sector. Yes, I'll give way. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much to Willie Rennie for giving way. I wonder whether I could invite him to say whether he would support a pay rise for social care workers. Willie Rennie. She's obviously read my speech. <laughs> I will come to that in a second because I'm going to address that issue. But on education, we want more bounce back funds for pupils to help them recover from this pandemic. The Scottish Government still doesn't have, we believe, adequate plans in place to give young people in our schools the boost that they need in the coming year. And of course, additional support for mental health is still required as we have a mental health crisis in this country. So there's a lot to do to put the recovery first and we're going to argue for it. But our plans will be affordable, I want to say to the Finance Secretary, and I'll be setting out details in a letter to her in the coming days to make sure that we fully understand together what we are seeking to get. We will be abstaining on both the amendments today, as we want to take the issues raised by both the Conservatives and the Labour Party into those discussions. I'm particularly supportive of the aims of the £15 campaign for social care. And we've had discussions with the GMB about that, so I'm keen to explore further with the government what can be done in that area. Liberal Democrats have always been a party that has hunted for agreement rather than chasing after division. Over the last year, we've worked constructively with a host of ministers, and I can hear them crying out right now. They are desperate for more cooperation. Yet we disagree, sometimes vigorously, because it is our role to scrutinise and challenge to make sure things are better. But of course, in the middle of a global pandemic, when thousands of people have died, even more are in hospital, thousands are out of work, and our way of life has been shut down. It takes the combined efforts of everyone to overcome the challenges. We want the budget to succeed to get the money to schools, to businesses and to mental health that needs that support. There will be no guarantees that we will support the budget at stage three, but with goodwill and a bit of give and take on both sides, it might just be possible. At a time of crisis, we must do our best to make things work. Thank you very much. And I now call on Patrick Harvey. 
Uh, I was assuming that we would hear from Bruce Crawford in the stage three debate on the budget as well. But if that was his last contribution as committee convener, can I thank him for his work in that role? And I think that's something that will be uh, echoed by uh, all me members of all parties, including everyone who served on the Finance and Constitution Committee. Presenting officer, the Green approach to budgets has always been focused on putting forward positive, workable proposals, seeking to make improvements. Our work is the reason why local government has not seen the cuts that the SNP has proposed since 2016. It's why Scotland has a fairer tax system, which the Greens alone proposed at the last election. It's why we've seen progress on issues from marine protected areas to local rail, from teachers' pay to energy efficiency. And it's why we'll see free bus travel come in for under-19s this year. While others often seem to think that defeating the budget and throwing public services into crisis should be their objective, we know that winning improvement is the real objective, and that while voting down a budget, budget can be a necessary step, it should be a last resort. This year, we've set out some clear challenges for the government. Supporting household incomes, especially targeting those most in need. For goodness sake, if they can afford a council tax freeze, which gives the biggest savings to the wealthy, they must be able to take the more progressive steps too, whether that's via social security or by cutting other costs like energy bills and public transport, or indeed by ensuring fair public sector pay. It's not for any political party to undermine the role of unions in determining what they should accept, but it's clear that the government will need to go further to meet reasonable demands. And we've also set out proposals to take forward a truly green recovery. All political parties talk a good game on this, but then keep on backing oil and gas, aviation, road building, and all of the failed priorities of the past. This needs to be replaced with investment in a sustainable future. So we've put these priorities to the government, and we don't yet have agreement. We therefore cannot yet support the budget, and we will abstain to allow it to proceed to stage two. Now, that situation was probably inevitable, given that, yet again, the UK government has delayed its own budget until after the Scottish budget has been published. They seem committed to wrecking their own fiscal framework. Let me turn to the amendments. The Tory amendment uh, refers to the draft budget, which, of course, does not even exist. It also casts judgment on the settlement for local government before we know what the final position is going to be. As for the Labour amendment, I strongly support the call for fair pay for social care workers. But Labour MSPs know that there is no possible amendment to the budget which can achieve that. The Scottish Government is not the employer of social care workers, and it cannot directly change their pay rate. As the campaign by Unite the Union makes clear, we need national and sectoral bargaining covering all care workers in order to achieve this. That is something the Greens proposed in our Green New Deal for Workers paper last year. We will therefore abstain on the motion and on both amendments, and we will continue working toward budget changes to achieve improvement for Scotland's people, both in the immediate crisis in household incomes and in the long-term drive for a green recovery. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate, and I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am conscious, as the first backbench, um, to make backbencher to make a contribution this afternoon. This may be premature, but this is the, the most encouraging stage one budget debate I have um, participated in in my five years in this, in par in this Parliament, um, with substantive contributions from across the parties, and clearly a desire and a willingness to engage and get a budget that reflects all of our shared priorities. And I think that demonstrates that, contrary to, to what some may suggest, this Parliament is a robust institution, and as such, that when people do come together and work together in good faith, results can be achieved. And I think that is nowhere more in evidence um, as on the Finance and Constitution Committee. And while I don't think we have heard the last of my friend and colleague Bruce Crawford yet, I do want to pay tribute to Bruce and to the, uh, the clerks on the committee for all their hard work. 
One thing I'm always conscious of when speaking uh, in budget debates is we use a lot of big numbers for, which perhaps don't necessarily relate back to the lived experience of our constituents. So this is something I want to touch on in my contribution. And really to, what I want to do is to get the heart, get to the heart of what this budget actually means for people in Renfrewshire South. In my constituency, five high schools, 18 primary schools and one special school will benefit from over £1.8 million in pupil equity funding. This is funding to be spent at the discretion of head teachers to close the attainment gap. Now, in 2016, the SNP Scottish Government provided nearly £30 million in funding for a new Barhead High School. And the £1 billion Learning Estate Investment Programme will also benefit pupils in Renfrewshire South in coming years with a new primary campus for Nielsen Primary and St Thomas's Primary and also um, a new Thorn Primary in Johnston in due course. Families with young children will also benefit from the increase in ELC provision from 600 to 1,140 hours, saving families over £4,500 per child per year. Well, free school meals will save around £380 per year. Across Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire council areas, around 19,000 children and 12,000 families are expected to benefit from the Scottish Child Payment, thanks to £68 million of investment from the Scottish Government in this budget. The budget also delivers £70 million for the Young Persons Guarantee, continuing to provide work, education or training for every 16 to 24-year-old in my constituency and across Scotland. And all of this is being delivered in addition to ongoing support and commitments, such as the baby box, support giving to every family, regardless of their circumstances, to give children the best possible start in life. And over 30,000 of these have been given out in the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board area since 2017. And on health, our funding in Renfrewshire South will be increased, with a budget increase across NHS Greater and Glasgow Clyde, Clyde of over £33 million. This will help to ensure that our frontline health and uh, care services continue to receive the support that they require at what is, as we all understand, a very challenging time. Our councils have, of course, been in the front line of delivering support throughout this pandemic. In the last year, over £31 million in COVID-related funds have been given out to local authorities that cover the Renfrewshire South constituency area. This new budget increases Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire Council's combined budgets um, by 2.6 per cent. This is in addition to the £90 million that has been delivered across the country to support a freeze on council tax to help protect household incomes. I know from speaking to local business owners across Renfrewshire South the pressure that they have been under. The extension of 100% non-domestic rates relief for properties in the retail, hospitality, leisure and aviation sectors for all of the next financial year will come as a huge relief. High streets across my constituency are hubs for small businesses and the commitment of this support I know will be welcome news. And this budget will help to protect our communities as we continue to fight the pandemic. With urgent measures put in place, this budget also provides financial stability for those who need it, easing pressure on household incomes, helping those who need it and reducing their financial burden. This budget does give hope that, as we focus on rebuilding, we can ensure that opportunities are available for all communities, including in my constituency around the South and across Scotland, as we emerge from this pandemic. And for those reasons, I will be supporting this budget at stage one. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Halcrow Johnson, who will be followed by Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I remind members of my register of interests as a partner in a farming business? And, Presiding Officer, I recognise that this budget comes at a time when all governments are facing unprecedented challenges. This period ahead of us will likely be the most unusual and least predictable in the history of this Parliament. We should also be conscious at this time of even more extreme uncertainty for Scotland's businesses and people particularly those who are concerned about the security of their jobs and their incomes. Unfortunately, this week's statement from the First Minister did not offer a clear direction out of the tough restrictions that many businesses have operated under. In my own region, I've heard from many across tourism, hospitality and a range of other sectors that have been left disappointed with the lack of a route map out of restrictions. These businesses have too often had lengthy waits to access support funding, which even when or if it arrives, has only just about kept them afloat. But beyond that, many have, had made, have made considerable losses. Public bodies, too, have been forced to work in entirely different ways. Many schools and other centres of learning have been empty for months. Hospitals have had a complete refocusing of the care and treatment they provide. The police have had additional demands placed on them. And local councils have been handed the administration of a number of business support schemes, as well as being at the front line in terms of social care and other services. And that's put a huge additional pressure on them and in some cases, 
at least that has impacted on their abilities to deliver what is expected of them. So this should have been a budget that is ambitious for recovery. To build back better is approaching a cliche, but it must be part of our consideration at every stage. As the rural economy and other committees have been considering as part of the scrutiny of the climate change plan update, we must also be aiming for a green recovery that ensures that hard-won progress against climate targets do not go backwards. And a key part of that is how the government manages its rural economy. Unfortunately, this comes against the backdrop where little guidance or clarity is forthcoming from SNP ministers about the future of rural support and how it will be delivered. Ours is a rural sector that acknowledges the need for change, but it's also looking for certainty too. Despite the government's rhetoric, this draft budget saw programmes like the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme given a headline cut of 20% at a time when we are told environmental measures are more essential than ever. Another key measure, the Agricultural Transformation Programme, which supports sustainability and innovation in farming, saw a huge underspend last year, which was then reallocated in other areas. What this adds up to is a Scottish Government that is happy to talk about change being essential in the rural sector, yet seems to be undermining vital capital investment schemes to achieve that, all the while piling on additional regulation. In the coming year, the leader programme so valued by our sector will see its spending cut almost in half. Yes, of course. Good for it. I'm just curious because the member has listed quite a number of schemes that come from the EU originally and replacement funds haven't been forthcoming from the UK government. That is why there has been substantial cuts in these areas. Is that, is that something he would take up with his UK government colleagues? Jimmy Hawkley Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. This is a point actually the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy made, and, and the point I made back to them this was a question of choice given the additional funding that the, UK that the Scottish Government have received from the UK government over the last year. Um, and of course the convergence money, hard won by the industry and the Scottish Conservatives, has been dipped into to top up the budget for the less favoured area support scheme, taking from one part of the sector to give away to another in a move described by the NFU Scotland as the Scottish Government shortchanging the farming sector. In all of this, what the sector really needs is a sense of direction, evidence that there is a strategy for the medium term, that ministers know what they're where they're going and that the desired priorities of today will be linked to the delivered priorities of tomorrow. And this budget is a missed opportunity for that. Presiding officer, despite the challenges, as Murdo Fraser quite rightly reminded us, this is the largest budget that any Scottish Government has ever had at its disposal. Hundreds of millions of pounds in support have found their way to this Parliament to allocate, and we have seen further unprecedented sums through programmes like the Job Retention Scheme directly supporting hundreds of thousands of jobs. This is a budget that would have been impossible without the security of being part of the United Kingdom. It should also have been a budget that shows ambition, that set a path for the time ahead and the challenges we face. But instead, it's a budget that falls short, one that finds this SNP government want wanting when businesses and working people in rural Scotland need help most. Thank you. I call Annabel Ewing to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you. Presiding officer, at the outset of my brief remarks this afternoon, I would wish to commend the Finance Secretary Kate Forbes for her very consensual approach to the setting of this year's budget. And such a consensual approach is entirely fitting in these unprecedented times and quite rightly properly reflects the very difficult year that the people of Scotland have endured and the difficult months that lie ahead as our economy takes steps on the road to recovery and sustainable renewal. And can I say I'm very pleased indeed to note that discussions on a pay increase for social care workers uh, are ongoing, for they are indeed, each of them, angels, every one. The budget set forth includes a significant number of very important initiatives, including support for public sector workers and for business. And in the time, short time available, I would like to highlight a few uh, of the, these initiatives that will make a real difference to the lives of my Cowden Beath constituents. First, I very much welcome the additional £125 million to help young people, those who have been made redundant and the long-term unemployed. And in that regard, uh, £70 million will support the Young Persons Guarantee, a key SNP Scottish Government uh, intervention to help young people find work training or educational opportunity. And given the impact of the 
coronavirus pandemic on the younger generation, it is absolutely vital that all of us do everything we can to help young people through to the other side of the pandemic and to ensure that they are not left behind. In terms of those who have lost their jobs, an additional £35 million is being made available for skills and retraining, including for the National Transition Training Fund, which specifically supports people who are unemployed uh, or at risk of redundancy further to the pandemic. And a further £20 million is to be made available to support the longer term unemployed. Another area of spending that will be of particular importance to my Cowdenbeath constituents is the commitment to spend £182 million to close the attainment gap. Each child in my Cowdenbeath constituency deserves the same life chances and opportunities as every other child in Scotland. And it is to the credit of the SNP Scottish Government that they are determined to make that a reality. Third, housing is, of course, an important issue in my Cowdenbeath constituency, as it is indeed across Scotland. And so the planned investment by the SNP Scottish Government of more than £3.5 billion over the next five years is also very welcome news indeed. Finally, the £90 million made available by the SNP Scottish Government to support a further council tax freeze is very welcome and good news today for households in Fife, where we hear that Fife Council has indeed frozen council tax for the financial year 2021 2022, in light of this additional funding being made available to it. In conclusion, presiding officer, it would be remiss of me not to place the Scottish Government budget in the context in which it sits, and that is regrettably that it cannot take account of all of Scotland's resources and it cannot reflect in all aspects the priorities of the people of Scotland. Rather, we can only plead with the UK Tory government in London, a government that we in Scotland did not vote for, to, for example, extend the furlough scheme, or, for example, to make the universal credit uplift permanent, or indeed to uh, request that uh, a further return to Westminster austerity politics uh, is rejected. For power over our resources continues to lie with Westminster, which retains the key economic levers that every other normal independent country takes for granted. Indeed, what rational person hands over their money to a neighbour and gives them absolute power without a veto over how it is spent? Scotland has been too long in this condition, presiding officer, and independence is coming. Thank you. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Emma Harper. Thanks very much, uh, President Officer. The convener of the uh, Economy Committee is right. Uh, COVID has exposed more than ever the class divisions in our society. And the poorest and those in insecure work and unsuitable housing are twice as likely to die from COVID than others. The poorest are three times more likely to commit suicide, more likely to die from addiction or cancer uh, or suffer from obesity. And they're more likely to be the key workers who've kept the country from collapsing, the shop and food production workers, bus drivers, social care staff and factory workers. They cannot work from home. You can't drive a bus from your living room. They don't have the option of showering an 80-year-old disabled person from the kitchen table whilst the banana loaf browns in the agar. They are the people who we all clapped on our doorsteps. Some people taking videos and selfies to show just how compassionate they are. Well, stuff your videos and your selfies. The way to show you care, the way to show you care is in this budget by committing real hard cash to improve their lives. Not by imposing, certainly. Tom Arthur. To Neil Finlay for giving way. I think he raises some really important points. One of the concerns I have is when we move back into the level system, it was some parts of the country which found it really difficult to get out of level four and level three. Does he agree with me that there needs to be specific resource targeted at these areas if we find once we move back into the level system that they are struggling to get down? I'm glad Mr, I'm glad Mr. Uh, Arthur's finally came round to that view. We've been ar arguing, I've been arguing all my time in this parliament that resources have to go to the communities in most need. It's just a shame that the government hasn't been listening. Um, the, way is, the way to show you care is by committing real hard cash, not imposing a 1% uh, 
uh, pay increase as the government has done it in the NHS, but by paying a minimum of £15 an hour in the health and social care sector. Now, last week we saw pictures of 200 people queuing up in the snow for charitable food. And this shocked many people, but it shouldn't have shocked people. It's not new and it's not just in Glasgow. Every night I pass a food van parked outside the rear entrance to Waverley Station, feeding queues of hungry people. And across every region, community projects are doing similar heroic work. This is a scandal that's off the scale. I wrote to all party leaders a few weeks ago, calling for cross-party talks to see if we could come together to end hunger in Scotland. I received a, a reply from Jackie Bailey and from Andy Whiteman. Not a word from anyone else. Are we not all ashamed to live in a country that cannot provide its citizens with the most basic human need, food? Are we not ashamed of that? I am certainly ashamed of that. And what about housing? We had a housing crisis long before COVID. And we heard this week that Scotland has three times the level of deaths amongst homeless people as England. And what's the government's cunning plan to deal with this? To cut the affordable housing budget by £100 million. And of those who die, those homeless people who die, more than half were drug users. So the government announces an extra £50 million out of the social housing budget that would have helped house the very same people. It's all just a game to the finance secretary. But in the real world, on the street, People are dying. And we see the government, who are going to scrap the unfair council tax, go back to a freeze that will deliver a massive one penny a month for the lowest households, but £30 a month for the highest earning. And these are deliberate political dismiss uh, decisions, dismissing the poor and the low paid because they're less inclined to vote and rewarding the middle class who do. The Cabinet Secretary, I have no doubt, will trot out her well-rehearsed lines about if you want to do other things, where does the money come from? Well, this, money, this government pours money down the drain like there's no tomorrow. So let me tell you where the money will come from. It will come from the same place as the £100 million to pay off the maliciously prosecuted Rangers liquidators. The same place as the £100 million to pay for the extra money for ferries. The £650 million for delayed discharge over five years. It can come from there. Or the £16 million for remedial work to the sick kids' hospital. The £1.4 million a month in charges for the same hospital that hasn't treated a patient. The £50 million of remedial work at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. The million pounds of taxpayers' money on the Alex Salmon case. The salary and expenses of her predecessor who never turns up for his work the 54,000 to coach civil servants to answer questions at an inquiry. That's where the money will come from, Cabinet Secretary. I would rather it be spent going in the mouths of hungry people and putting a roof over them head, their heads than you and the government pouring more money down the drain. The money is there. What's not there is the political will. Thank you. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. President officer, um, I welcome the comments uh, and the commitments which have been set out in the budget. This budget has a specific commitment to enterprise and that's one which will be of immense benefit to constituents across Dumfries and Galloway in my South Scotland region. Tom Arthur spoke about how the big numbers affect and impact his constituents and that's important. This budget commits to increasing the funding available to Scotland's enterprise agencies, including to the newly established South Scotland Enterprise Agency. Um, it became operational in 2020 and it hit the ground run running right at the start of the COVID pandemic lockdown. This budget commits an additional £3.4 million in resource funding and an additional £5 million in capital funding for SOCI, a combined additional investment of £8.4 million on top of the statutory funding the agency is to receive each year. And SOCI is working with the Friesen Galloway Council. They have provided direct financial and practical support to over 500 businesses across DNG with essential support packages ranging from £1,000 to £100,000 during this pandemic. 
The leadership, Professor Russell Grigson, CEO Jane Morrison-Ross and their teams of staff have been absolutely fantastic and very helpful in my contact with them on behalf of constituencies and businesses, and I thank them. Since commencement, SOSI has been so crucial in ensuring local projects, community groups and initiatives are supported to survive and grow. SOSI have provided direct funding to community groups assisting with COVID resilience, as well as to initiatives which are actively working to make Dumfries and Galloway an attractive place for people and businesses. And we really do need that. One programme is the UNESCO-designated Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere. It received £1.9 million recently, which is also working to educate and mitigate against the impact of climate change and the climate emergency. The additional funding awarded to SOSI in the budget will allow continued support across the Friesen Galloway and will undoubtedly continue to shine a light on our region. Presiding officer, the budget also contains over £100 million in funding to support infrastructure and active transport. This funding in includes work to improve recommendations in the South West Scotland Transport Study, meaning much needed improvements to the A75, 76 and 77, including improved East West rail links and bus infrastructure. Many constituents have contacted me about that. I would encourage the Scottish Government to continue to ensure these commitments are implemented and expedited as much as possible. Presiding officer, also 97,000 affordable homes have been delivered since this Government came to office, nearly 67,000 of which were for social rent, including over 14,000 council homes. This is 1,621 social and 1,614 affordable homes across DNG in this session of Parliament alone. And since 2007, 4,484 new homes have been built in Dumfries and Galloway. I don't the members think I have in the time. last minute, it's only four minute speeches. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Um, the, the building of these new homes has directly uh, benefited families across my region. And between November 19 to December 31, 2020, 1,470 people in De Vries and Galloway applied for the Scottish Child Payment, which will be worth £10 per child for low-income families by the end of 22. I have been working with people in North West Dumfries and also with the Lockside Community Centre and Grub Club. And they've been providing meals to local families with support with Scottish Government budget money. And I've just written to the Cabinet Secretary asking whether the Government can help the, the club match money they already have to purchase a van to deliver meals. Presiding Officer, to conclude, I welcome the budget and I support the motion today Thank at you. stage one. Thank you. I'm sorry, there's no time in hand, so I've got to be quite strict. I don't know why it always lands in my lap, this, but there we go. I now call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is the strength of our union that has allowed us to weather the storm of this crisis and deliver unprecedented funding during this pandemic. And this is reflected in the Scottish budget boost. We see an increase of 11% more funding from last year as a result, bringing the resource budget to just shy of 38 billion and allowing the SNP to agree to a number of Scottish Conservative budget priorities. We are grateful for the engagement Kate Forbes has given. The overall spending outlook for Scotland for 2020-21 is better than it has been for some time due to in large part to the 9.7 million Barnet consequentials from the UK government, which is more funding for the NHS and for supporting most businesses across Scotland. As we analyse the budget today at stage one, this was Kate Forbes' chance to provide our fantastic local authorities with much needed help at a time of national crisis, but I believe this, short, this budget is short-sighted. Presiding officer, for the past 14 years, the SNP have ra raided, sorry, raided council budgets. I am sorry, presiding officer. You're having a bit of a musical years, accompaniment, Miss Hamilton. I hope somebody's found out whose it, it is. Be a timer. <laughs> presiding officer, for the past 14 years, the SNP have raided council budgets, and this has run down the ability of local authorities to react the ravages of inclement weather, such as repairing potholes the size of craters on our roads or progressing essential flood risk defences. Ms Forbes may remember that in 2018, the Scottish Conservatives called for a £100 million pothole action fund. However, years later, there is still no extra support for local authorities to deal with these crumbling roads. Furthermore, the Scottish Government must recognise extreme weather patterns and recognise 
that an extra 150 million for flood risk management perhaps isn't enough when considering the damage done to the homes of my constituents in Newcastleton in the last 24 hours. So in summing up, I urge the Finance Secretary to say whether the SNP will support a fair funding settlement for local authorities. The Scottish Conservatives want funding for councils so that they receive a set amount of the Scottish Government's budget each year, mirroring the block grant from the UK Government. A fair funding settlement would also address concerns over sustainability for essential youth programmes and projects delivered by local authorities. I appreciate this is not all on the uh, Finance Secretary's watch, but for the past 14 years, they have raided council budgets to pay for their own failed bailouts and botched projects. The amount of money the SNP gives to local authorities has fallen by 276 million in real terms since 1314. This has run down local services like youth groups and initiatives. And according to Unison's recent report, youth services are at breaking point. Youth service spending in Scotland has been cut by over 11 million in the last three years alone. And a youth link uh, report from a survey recently also showed a funding crisis in the sector. And we know that all this is a disproportionate impact on those from deprived, deprived backgrounds compounded by the pandemic. Things are sadly only going to deteriorate further unless councils are giving the funding they deserve in order to restore these services. I don't think I have much time left, presiding officer. So in, in conclusion, um, we will not support uh, the budget at stage one tonight because without a doubt, the SNP budget offers little in the way of hope for the local authorities to provide the essential services required to support the most vulnerable people in our communities as we re rebuild our way out of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call John Mason to be followed by Mark Macdonald. Mr Mason, please. Hey, thank you very much, hey, presiding officer. Uh, as has been said already, the timing of the budget this year is very far from ideal. I do accept that it's been incredibly difficult over the last 12 months for either government at either Westminster or Holyrood to plan far ahead. So I do understand why the UK is having its budget at this point. However, quite frankly, it is still not acceptable. How can any of the devolved governments properly set a budget when we do not know what the UK budget contains? In particular, personal allowances and other aspects of income tax are essential for us to know, as income tax is not a fully devolved tax and we can only vary certain parts of it. So clearly it should be normal that the UK sets its budget first, we follow on and local government can then build on that afterwards. On the question of a Scotland-specific economic shock, we face the slightly odd situation that the requirements for such a shock have been triggered but it does not seem there actually has been such a shock. Rather, it seems to be because of timing differences between the OBR and Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts. So that means we have more flexibility for the next three years, and that is very welcome. However, this will need to be addressed in the budget for 2024-25. But this was clearly not the scenario that was expected when the fiscal framework was put in place. What both governments were trying to cater for was where the Scottish economy took a hit which did not impact on the UK as a whole, or at least not to the same extent. I think this shows that it is impossible to foresee all that might occur when any fiscal framework is put in place, or when it is reviewed as is expected fairly soon. When the OECD reviewed the Scottish Fiscal Commission, they co commented that we already have one of the most complex fiscal frameworks in the world. We also heard from the Citizens' Assembly that a recurring theme was that the public are not understanding our tax system. So I would appeal to both governments to certainly make any renewed fiscal framework as fair as possible, but also to see if they can make it more simple and understandable. Because if one of the aims is for the public to hold accountable a particular government which makes a particular decision, then frankly, I do not consider that as happening at the moment. I think one of the most important sections of the committee report is on pages 26 and 27, headed A Fair and Equal Economic Recovery, and also subheaded Differential Social and Economic Impact. It seems clear COVID has made existing structural inequalities worse. Some people, and in particular the better off, have seen their incomes largely unaffected by the economic downturn, whereas others on low or precarious incomes have been hit harder. This needs to be tackled both in how we spend the resources we have this coming year, as I believe has been done in the current year, but also will impact on how we look at taxation in future years. 
If I get to speak in the next debate, I will touch on that more then. I would also touch on the debate from yesterday on local government. It is well and fine to want a more fixed settlement for councils, but if they are to receive relatively more money, then some other sector will be receiving less, and that is likely to be the NHS, who I accept have been treated relatively generously in recent years. So effectively, the Conservatives are saying that the NHS has received too much funding in recent years, and local authorities have not received enough. Now, that is a perfectly valid argument to put forward, although I'm not sure they've actually said that at the time of previous budgets. But I do think they cannot only ask for more spending for councils. In order to be believed, they need to say that that means less for the NHS. If members got as far as pages 39 and 40 of the Finance Committee report, they would come to the section on Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. Amongst other things, this refers to MSP's staff cost provision, which is planned to rise from £18 million by £5.8 million. And you million. must conclude. As the report says, this is justified because of rising workloads, but I have to say I have slightly mixed feelings about it. I support the budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Mark Macdonald, to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Mr Macdonald, please. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Officer. And can I say at the beginning, um, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for her meeting with me last week to discuss some of the issues uh, in relation to the budget. And I hope um, perhaps by stage three, she may be able to say a little bit more about some of the issues I raised, which I will reference in my speech today. Um, Willie Rennie alluded to the northeast of Scotland in his opening um, to his speech, and it will come as no surprise that I intend to focus the bulk of my remarks on the, the city of Aberdeen and the issues that have been faced here. Indeed, the statistics regarding Aberdeen are, on the face of them, uh, quite bleak. Um, the business rates increase in 2017, which has been much rehearsed in the Chamber, um, saw business rates in Aberdeen rise um, at a level 15% above the national average. 30% of all notified redundancies in Scotland during the course of this pandemic uh, have been in Aberdeen City. And while there are 5,497 properties in Aberdeen which sit under the £18,001 threshold for small business bonus, there are only 2,190 who receive it. In percentage terms, 23% of businesses in Aberdeen City received small business bonus um, against a national average of 50% of businesses across Scotland. So I raised with the Cabinet Secretary a number of things which she could consider uh, in relation to the budget. The first is in relation to the transitional relief, which was welcome and introduced in 2017 following the revaluation. The multipliers on that transitional relief um, mean that the support which has been provided year on year has reduced. That was always the intention. However, the economic storm that has hit Aberdeen uh, as a result of coronavirus, uh, alongside the, um, the failure of the oil price to recover and bounce back, um, means that there has been a double whammy for businesses. And therefore, resetting the multipliers on the, the transitional relief so it returns to 2017 levels could provide significant support for over 1,000 businesses in the northeast of Scotland. Another thing which the Cabinet Secretary could do is to look uh, at the issue of low small business bonus uptake in Aberdeen and to understand what it is that is driving it. There will be some businesses which undoubtedly uh, will fall outside of the threshold as a result of the multiple properties issue, um, but I cannot believe that that applies to as many businesses as seem to not be receiving. Um, work could be done with local agencies to increase uptake um, of this vital support. But business rates are only one element. And one of the things which I believe the Scottish Government needs to do is to understand more widely uh, what the issues are around the costs of doing business, particularly for small businesses, um, and how these could be relieved. Indeed, one of the issues which the FSB have raised with me is that small businesses are keen to make a digital transition uh, to more online ways of working. But with the recent digital boost funding having been snapped up in a matter of hours, Many of them don't understand where they can achieve the support enabled to enable that transition. And finally, presiding officer, um, I mentioned the redundancies issue at the start of my speech. We saw with the last financial crisis 
that where people were made redundant, many of them chose that as a moment to start up their own business. We, will, we may well see a surge in new startups um, as we move into the recovery phase. And I would seek assurances from the Cabinet Secretary that the Scottish Government and its agencies stand ready to support those new startups and ensure that they have every possibility of success in the future. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Macdonald. I call Joan McAlpine, the last speaker in the open debate. Ms McAlpine. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I welcome the commitment to explore carers' pay and look forward to the outcome of Ms Forbes' talks with other parties on this matter. This will not be easy in the context of the UK's public sector pay freeze, and it should be noted that the budget sets out a distinctive Scottish pay policy that again supports the lowest paid, charting a very different course to that ill-judged UK pay freeze. I think we all want to see social care workers properly rewarded, and I look forward to the progress. If there is goodwill on all sides, I'm sure we can achieve it. It's very clear uh, the Cabinet Secretary has said she does not have all the tools she needs to build the bud budget that she might want to deliver in an ideal world. All the UK government spending in response to COVID and subsequently the consequentials passed to Scotland come from borrowing. The block on Scotland borrowing on the financial markets or even using unspent capital funding to address immediate needs is simply not acceptable. Much has been said today about the generosity of the UK government, but it is, of course, our money, uh, whether we pay it in taxes or we take a share of borrowing which must be paid back. The Cabinet Secretary has also laid out very clearly that much of the additional funding allocated by the UK Government is of a short-term nature, restricted to addressing the pandemic and its fallout. The £1.1 billion spending announced on 15 February, of course, is welcome, and I particularly welcome the additional £120 million for mental health, something that is so necessary given the trauma and social isolation imposed on so many by the lockdown. In addition to that, I very much welcome the extension of 100% non-domestic rates relief for properties in the retail, hospitality, leisure and innovation sectors uh, for all of 2021-22. I am acutely aware of the challenges faced by these businesses as convener of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee. Scotland's tourism industry plays a proportionately larger role in the economy when compared to other nations and regions of the UK directly contributing 229,000 jobs, or 8.8 per cent of all Scottish employment. This reliance on the tourism sector makes Scotland particularly vulnerable to the consequences of a global pandemic. In a recent survey by the Scottish Tourism Emergency Response Group found that out of 3,000 responses, a fifth of businesses still in operation have no cash reserves left. With the likely continuation of both international and domestic travel restrictions, the sector will face further pressures this year. That is why I welcome the additional £25 million uh, for funding uh, announced through Visit Scotland business support schemes in February. And this, of course, builds on the £104 million uh, package of support for tourism and hospitality announced in December. But the UK government needs to do more if we are to save our tourism infrastructure. And that's why I was very pleased that Kate Forbes had written uh, to the Chancellor asking him to extend the furlough scheme beyond April, something that all of our tourism witnesses to the committee have asked for. In conclusion, I welcome this budget for recovery and urge everyone to support it. I welcome the COVID consequentials so far, but we all know that demand continues to outstrip resources. And the Scottish Government's inability to borrow on the financial part markets or use unspent capital funding uh, to address uh, what we need to spend now is completely unacceptable. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms McAlpine. I now move to closing speeches. I call on Claudia Beamish to close for Labour. Ms Beamish, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's continuing offer to support other parties in looking for consensus on this budget. I will start with our Scottish Labour call for radical action and upfront uh, investment of this budget, which it still needs to deliver on if we are to kickstart a green jobs recovery and to set firmly on the path of social justice. And shovel ready energy efficiency programmes will mean skilled jobs creation quickly 
poverty and early action. Ms. Beamish, could you just stop a minute? You're yeah. breaking up a bit. So I wonder if you switch the visuals off, if the sound will improve, which sometimes that trick works. Much do we like to see you, it's so we can hear you. <laughs> right. OK, thank you. Right. Um, I'll, I'll continue. Uh, I've now just got on sound. Is that better, presiding officer? Indeed, it's wonderful. Oh, that's a relief. Good. OK. Um, early action on retrofitting will secure local jobs, preventing rising long-term costs, and tangibly improve the lives of many people. So while the 45 million additional funding announcement is welcome, it does not go far enough now to prevent the increasing cost of decarbonisation for everyone over time. Increasing fuel poverty, as well as the overall level of public investment, is required. And the Combined expertise of existing Homes Alliance, WWF Scotland, Friends of the Earth and more are calling for a doubling of the energy efficiency budget to 244 million for the next year, front loading the increased investment in the immediate term. This year, Scotland hosts a UK climate conference, COP26, and its build up. As a sub state host, Scotland must set an example for the rest of the world to follow with its approach to the support for other countries on the front line of climate impact. Despite this, the climate aimed at 3 million, and NGOs have called for this to rise to 10 million in such a significant year. Scottish Labour was a key voice in the Parliament securing climate justice and the Climate Change Act, and the Scottish Government should play a leading role in this process. Here in Scotland, the pandemic has exposed many pre-existing injustices, not least in the social care system. And Scotland's current, current care system is not working, despite the hard work and commitment of those employed in the sector. Many communities across Scotland are rural, including my own region. And in the south of Scotland, people are struggling to access the care they need. And a survey by the GMB Union revealed that more than half social care workers feel undervalued by the Scottish Government, and 98% of social care workers feel they were not paid properly for their job. Despite the poverty pay, there is an, an endemic throughout the, the, that is endemic throughout the sector. These workers, many of them women, as Jackie Bailey has stressed, have been in the forefront of caring for and protecting our loved ones in the present COVID crisis. The SNP need to show they are serious about investing in social care. And our motion today calls for exactly that, noting, as I, as I quote, the calls for an immediate rise to £12 an hour for all social care workers, followed by a review to establish steps to increase this to £15 an hour to fully recognise the value of their work. Now, Jackie Bailey commented that um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has highlighted in this debate that um, she offers to continue to discuss the issue, and we must get there. If the Scottish Government supports this call, Labour will support the budget at stage three. Scottish Labour is clear that transformation in social care is essential, and we must put people before profit. We also need to continue to discuss our other calls for funding in the budget, and to local government. This year's budget still falls short on a fair funding settlement, with councils left to foot the bill for their response to the pandemic. We can't have a strong, green, fair economic recovery without well-resourced local government. It is central to supporting and growing local economies through direct and indirect job creation, local investment, regenerating areas, and, I emphasise, and reducing inequality. In my own region, the SNP uh, South Lanarkshire Council administration were consulting on the closure of seven community libraries and cuts to school janitors. Due to pressure from the Labour group, these were taken off the table. However, the, the, um, the SNP administration and the Tories still voted through an austerity budget, rejecting Scottish Labour's alternative one. There is an alternative to austerity, like the successful approach taken by Scottish Labour North Ayrshire Council, where regional and anchor organisations support local businesses to bid for public sector contracts, cooperatives, employee ownership and social enterprises are encouraged. Money stays in the local economy. As Jackie Bailey today has stressed, the pandemic has exposed the inequalities in our society, which have been here for far, far too long. 
As we look to recover from the COVID crisis, Scotland needs robust investment and support where it really matters. And Scottish Labour is arguing for this today. Cuts are not the answer to this crisis. Uh, thank you, Ms. Beamish, and thank you. Can I just say some, finish this point? Okay, thank you, Ms. Beamish, and thank you for your perseverance, because we did hear you much, much better and clearly. Point of order, Mr. Jackson Carlo. Um, I realise these are unusual times, Presiding Officer, but I wonder if you could confirm whether, if a member makes a speech in the course of a debate from a seat in the chamber, they would normally be expected to return to hear the closing speeches in that same debate, or if that is not the convention currently. There is a convention, but when a member indicates to me, and now they can't send notes to the chair, unfortunately, so if they indicate to me that they're required to leave the chamber briefly, then I usually let that happen. So if you've observed that, it was with my permission. And I now call Maurice Golden, please, to uh, close with the Conservatives. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, Kate Forbes said in her opening statement that our overarching aim is to support the people of Scotland, and that is something we can both agree on. I'd also like to pay tribute to Bruce Crawford for his stewardship of the Finance Committee, as well as his uh, contributions in the Chamber and in Parliament and being such a statesperson, which uh, is something that we should all strive to achieve. Let me start by welcoming the positive measures in the budget, much of which can only be delivered as a result of being part of Britain, as Murdo Fraser highlighted in a rip-roaring speech referencing the deep pockets and broad shoulders of the British government. This was echoed by my colleague Jamie Halcrow Johnston, who outlined how the Scottish government are short-changing our agricultural sector. However, in terms of the positives, increased funding for the NHS is always welcome, and especially so during this pandemic. Frontline staff and the army of support workers behind the scenes have gone above and beyond this past year to care for us. It is only right that we give them additional resources, and Willie Rennie highlighted that mental health support should be part of that as well. And, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Budget's tax measures are also welcome. Individuals can look forward to a freeze on income tax rates thanks to the efforts of the Scottish Conservatives. We led the charge to prevent hard-pressed families seeing their tax bills rise again, and, uh, as, uh, as they have done in past SNP budgets. Thankfully, the SNP listened this time. Also welcome is the extension of 100% rates relief for retail, hospitality and leisure businesses. Again, it was the Scottish Conservatives pushing for this. We understand how vital that support is to protect jobs, a point well made by Rachel Hamilton, accompanied by some music. Um, as, as the member knows, I have extended non-domestic rates relief um, in advance of the UK government doing it. Uh, and does that suggest perhaps that the SNP are a, li a little bit quicker off the mark to supporting businesses than their counterparts south of the border that still haven't extended furlough or non-domestic rates relief? And, and can I say to members that there is time for interventions, Mr Golden? Thank you. I, I would hope you were intervening to welcome the unprecedented funding from the British government that has allowed Scotland and the Scottish government to be able to be so generous in certain cases. Because the initial SNP plan on this was to terminate that support early. And I know it will not have been easy for ministers to make such a significant public U-turn. But by following the Scottish Conservative plan, over 14,000 Scottish businesses are now better able to survive this crisis. And, Deputy Presiding Officer, that includes our newspaper industry, which employs 3,000 people. The Scottish Conservatives felt the SNP plan to end rates relief early was simply too risky for those jobs. So again, we intervened and again we saw a welcome U-turn from the SNP. Jackie Bailey spoke about a budget for recovery, and I agree with her that this budget offers that opportunity, but as yet fails to deliver it. 
perhaps because there are many businesses still struggling to access support, such as supply chain businesses. Not all have premises, so they've, they have refused hardship and te temporary closer, closure funding. That only leaves them with local authority discretionary funds. But eligibility varies across Scotland. In Renfrewshire, for example, the discretionary fund is open only to those business rates, those paying business rates, putting those without premises back at square one. Or in Inverness, where one amusement supply chain company employing 43 people has been unable to secure any funding and is struggling to survive. Trade body BACTA have called for a discrete support package to help, and I urge ministers to reconsider their opposition to that. Or from the cleaning businesses, one of whom, based in Barhead, has seen income levels drop by 85%. There is no guarantee that hospitality clients will reopen fully at the end of April, and despite providing the sole source of hygiene services to them, they are not able to claim the Strategic Business Framework grant as they are not classed as part of the supply chain. They are legally not required to shut down, but are also legally uh, not allowed to clean in people's homes, so they fall through the cr cracks. The local discretionary grant is a one-off fee of £2,000 and doesn't touch the sides. Job losses are imminent. Too many more businesses and sectors are in this position to mention them. But in terms of the roadmap to recovery, the Scottish Chamber of Commerce has said it does not go as far uh, or as fast as the Prime Minister did towards clarifying when we get back to business. Derek Proven, Chief, Exec Chief Executive of AGS Airport, said the First Minister provided a clear message to the aviation industry. It is not a priority for the Scottish Government. We received no plan or framework against which we start plotting any form of recovery. Or the Scottish Wedding Industry Alliance, close to the Cabinet Secretary's heart now, I assume. Uh, they report that their sector is in freefall, losing £6.5 million a day uh, in January alone and accounting for £205 million in lost businesses. Couples have lost hope. They can't put their lives on hold any longer and they don't believe they will be able to have the weddings they've dreamt of any time this year. Deputy President Officer, these budget choices show the SNP's true character. Jobs, housing, transport, councils, a green recovery and even the victims of crime, crime, none of these are important as the SNP holding another potentially illegal referendum. There is still time for them to do the right thing, defund referendum preparations, give councils the resources they need and protect as many jobs as possible. Thank you very much, Mr Golden. Kept going heroically despite heckling from your neighbour. Uh, can I call on Kate Forbes to close the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary, please. Well, I'm so glad that this has been a relatively traditional uh, budget debate where the only party to mention independence is, of course, the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Presiding officer, the last 12 months have been extraordinary and as we approach the end of the parliamentary term, it's essential that we do demonstrate unity for the people in Scotland to ensure that we deliver the Scottish budget required to continue Scotland's recovery from the pandemic. As we've heard in the course of this debate, there are uh, different nuances on the priorities that are different concerns, but I think we're all relatively agreed right now on what the priorities are. And that's why the budget that I've presented to this parliament will fund our key priorities for people, for businesses, and for communities throughout Scotland. It also provides us with the opportunity to demonstrate how we work together as a parliament to, Scot to support Scotland through the most difficult of times. And as uh, my first uh, few minutes of my speech, I wanted to pay tribute to, uh, to Bruce Crawford. I don't think this will be the last time we hear from him. I'm sure he'll be back for stage three as well. But it is helpful to reflect on the fact that the committee report and most um, committee reports have been consensual in terms of their commentary on the Scottish Government's uh, presented budget and also the priorities. The uh, report, which I will respond to, does highlight the challenges which John Mason picked up on of the fiscal framework, the fact that it hasn't uh, met the challenges of uh, COVID-related funding um, and the need for a review, which I hope all parties can get behind in the coming months. 
Presenting officer, I think this budget uh, demonstrates that we can either uh, rise to the occasion, find consensus and make compromises, or we can just resort to the politics. And Tom Arthur talked about what can be achieved uh, in good faith because consensus delivers results, and Willie Rennie and uh, the Liberal Democrats have demonstrated that with uh, ambition on mental health and uh, the securing of funding in this budget. The requirement to, to see certain policies, policies on education recovery delivered and the fact that there is again uh, funding in the budget to do that and as a minority government for the last few years there's been an opportunity every year to secure concessions and to find compromise and to negotiate on parties priorities to secure improvements to the budget it's very easy to criticize it's very easy to stand up and rail against uh, the government it's far harder to solve problems far harder to provide solutions and the budget enables every party and indeed every member to provide those solutions uh, every year. Patrick Harvey, as he said, has done that on behalf of the Green Party in the last few years. He has delivered substantial changes to the budget uh, every year. And this year, he identified the need to support household incomes to tackle inequalities um, and also talked about uh, public sector pay. Some of these we have already delivered, others I am open to continuing uh, discussions. The Tories um, listed all the great things in, in the budget, which is great. I might clip that speech for uh, Twitter tonight. There are a lot of great things in the budget, um, a lot of things which the people of Scotland depend on, um, a lot of uh, elements which businesses have asked for, communities have asked for. But of course, as I, I asked Murdo Fraser, these uh, elements will only be delivered if the budget passes. And so, again, it's one thing to call for things, but when they're delivered, it's quite remarkable to then vote against them. The Conservatives also talked, as they do generally, about the deep pockets of uh, the union. In fact, it is the, the deep uh, overdrafts of the union. And, of course, one does wonder how every other country around the world has funded its own COVID response without being part of this great United Kingdom. But, of course, they've done it exactly the same way as the UK government has done, which is through borrowing at record low levels. And it's... I will. It is well documented that the Scottish Government cannot borrow and is therefore reliant on when and if the UK Government comes to a decision on policies and then generates the Barnet consequentials. Murdo Fraser. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for, for giving way. If, if we were not part of Britain with the ability to borrow very cheaply on the international markets because of the strength of the uh, British financial institutions and the fifth largest economy in the world, in what currency would we be borrowing money? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we've been very clear that the currency of an independent Scotland will be the currency that we have right now, which is the pound. But of course, in terms of other small countries around the world, they have also been able to borrow at record low interest rates, in some cases at negative interest rates. Meantime, I have waited for the UK government to come to a decision on a policy which then generates funding, which we then um, can apply to our own decision making. And now we see them deviating completely from Barnet and choosing to spend directly in devolved areas and um, getting rid of Barnet, which is an issue that has raised concerns in Wales and Northern Ireland as well, amongst parties of a very different political persuasion uh, and uh, a very different uh, party. Um, Presiding officer, um, other members have made uh, important points. I wanted to um, close with comments that were made by uh, Tom Arthur um, and Annabel Ewing in particular, because they talked about the fact that although there are big numbers in this budget, it's about the impact on real people. It's about the impact on uh, schools, on children, on our young people. And within the constraints of, of every budget, which is required to balance, we have had to prioritise and make choices. And we have chosen to prioritise against our three objectives, against economic recovery, against ensuring that we uh, respond to the health pandemic and to ensure that we tackle uh, inequalities. This is a budget that responds to the moment. It has business support in it. Maurice Golden talked about the need to support the Scottish wedding industry. Well, if, indeed, of course, the Scottish government is the only government in the UK that is supporting uh, the wedding industry in that regard. But it also sets... The, the, the framework, it sets the foundation stones for recovery over um, the coming year because we do need hope. We need to be bold, we need to be ambitious and I am open, as I have been throughout uh, the last few weeks, to work with other parties to ensure that we can be as ambitious and bold as possible to respond to not only the requests across the Chamber but ultimately to respond to the needs of the people of Scotland who depend on this Parliament to work together and deliver a budget. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And that concludes the debate on the Budget Scotland No. 5 Bill, and it's time to move on to the next item of business. And everyone's here for that. And the next item of